I have two, two very brief thoughts, and uh, and then what I was hoping was that each of these um, speakers would address questions to one another, and I even asked them actually to target each other um, and, and to have questions for specific um, talks. Um, but but uh, somebody's going to have to sort of call it at a certain point, I think, um, when it's over. Uh, so the two things, I, I, I'm struck by... Um, <coughs> in these presentations uh, uh, by the question of whether or not history writing has, has uh, uh, taken on the kind of critical uh, ambitions that previously were associated with architecture. And in a sense, I want to blame everything on somebody who's not here, and that's Michael Hayes, um, for, uh, for kind of foisting upon architects a an agenda that perhaps was never theirs. Um, and that was the, the critical project. I think you could perhaps ask the question of whether or not uh, the critical, the so-called critical project belongs to, to the historians largely, um, and that the division that we're calling critical plus critical in the field of architecture um, is really one that is about the different agendas or, or arenas of um, historical practices versus, uh, versus design practices. So that's a question for the members of the panel, a very general question. Um, the other thing that comes up, uh, there's so many, I, I have many questions, and I could sort of go on asking them questions and indefinitely, so um, I, I'm not going to do that, but, I, but, but I'll put a second issue out on the table, and then if we want to get more specific to the talks, we can also do that. Um, and that, that second large issue, in addition to the, to the question about critical versus post-critical, the second question is, it, is about the, the juxtaposition in these talks of, of and of, in the session before, of presentism and heritage, both as being some kind of, um, in a sense, uh, paradoxically, uh, sort of enemies of historical practice. Um, that is to say, uh, history is stopped or stabilized or neutralized by both of those, um, by both of those discourses, presentism or uh, or heritage practices. And I have a sense that these. Uh, panelists have something to say on that on that issue, so I'll stop there for now. Um, maybe Lucia and Mark want to start with that question. Uh, I, would like um, I, would, I Yes, um, I mean, presentism is a big problem. Um, I mean, one encounters it as a type of practice, and it's perfectly fine. I mean, you know, as long as it does, does what it does, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you need a lot of presentists, you know, to sort of get to the other type of project. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not that one can go out and say presentism is wrong per se and that people shouldn't be doing it. Um, they, uh, my uh, question was that basically what we do is history. What we often do is history. You know, actually is presentism. <coughs> but it, we call it history. And, and this, is, uh, this is the slippery problem that we sort of, I, I think we encounter in our own, own field, increasingly so, you know, you know, when we produce works around certain types of, you know, cultural <coughs> national sort of tropes without understanding it, it's presentism. It's, it's not anything, for me, anything other than that, mm -hmm. right? It may be history, it may be written by, by historians who teach history, uh, who have PhDs in history and history programs, but it's presentism. So presentism isn't an architecture, it's actually, historian sort of idea all around us. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit more, I was trying to be more methodological about it, which is to say that essentially if you read his, historians, the American historian, the big institution you know, producing books, they increasingly identify presentism, and for them it's clearly a, a social condition at large, and <coughs> increasingly architects and architectural discourse appears in there as something that diagnoses it, but also that is able to read different regimes of historicities at different times. And so I think that we are in this quandary as architectural historians where we're given this relevance, where we can talk about uh, sort of cultural phenomena with a privileged <coughs> point of view. And I was trying to make the point, I mean, to connect the two, I think that I don't think presentism and heritage per se are enemies of historical practice. They're just not self-conscious historical practices. So for example, preservation is an extremely um, well-trained, much more well-trained in politics and materials, let's say, than architects and architectural historians are, but they don't know it because they think that they have a cause and they, or, or in any case, they have 
they think they are preserving the thing. So they don't realize that what they talk about really is stone and politics. And so I think that there's actually exchanges to be had methodologically between them. Um, but whether our intervention, at, you know, whether we are teaching then architects to do that, to sort of slip out from under presentism or not, I think is not really decided yet. Do you have uh, questions for one another? Mark, how do you um, deal with the problem that you outline in the classroom? I mean, teaching a course on global history, how do you shift from just making everyone want to hang themselves through to, um, to <laughs> teaching students history of architecture? What, what, are, the, what are the premises, uh, um, thinking in a positive way? Uh, yeah, yes, I know. I, I tried. This is all negative, and I didn't get into the positive at all. And of course, I can do that. Uh, you know, give me no, no, another hour to sure. get in that. Because I just wanted to present the fight, mm. I guess, that's at stake here, rather than just sort of saying that just because we can try to teach it, we're sort of solving the problem. And in some sense, you know, this is, you know, snow is melting against a, uh, a wrought iron skillet. I mean, you know, that's heated up. You're not even going to make it, you know. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I do teach a course, uh, and you know, I know, uh, and others you know struggle with this. You know, who who sort of, I mean, I think I'm not, I mean, it's not like I'm the only one. I think there's a, a that's really emerging sort of um, generation that's trying to sort of solve this problem. And in our teaching, in our writing, uh, so there's there's a lot of good uh, historic history out there that I would say you know is it would be only a good example of that, right? If I had a, to give the, the the good side of the coin. I would point to, to, to that. It's just that it's not, not much. You know, that's, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm hopeful, but I wanted to not just sound all that, you know, naively optimistic, you know, because then we sort of sit back and do our thing, right? I think we really have to sort of see, you know, the demon in the eye um, and, and struggle with it. Uh, but yeah, there are ways to teach it that I think can be invented in many different, different ways. You know, I teach the course uh, through a geopolitical sort of lens, uh, so that each lecture basically is a geopolitical moment in time, and then, you know, uh, do go from there into sort of the architectural history. Uh, but there can be different ways to do it, for sure. Yes, I have a question for Andrew. Um, I, I'm struck by, uh, I, you said something about the difference between Zevi and, and Tafuri as being sort of one looking for models and the other one interested in messiness, and I think that that's really, well, I'm, I love the viscosity idea, and I was also struck by finding that in Tafuri's language, and if you read what he says about, you know, well, I was reading about preservation of Venice. It's all about how Venice, why is Ven Venice still this thinking pond? And he's very descriptive about the stinkiness and the pondness. Um, so how important is it that we continue to read those two figures, let's say, as, as two models, rather than, let's say, talk about the models that Tufri was looking at outside of architectural history, that he was reading Ginsburg, or that he was involved with an entire other series of historical practices that maybe, um, our caricaturing of them, and I'm sure there will uh, be more talk about this tomorrow, is really just isolating them as models. In other words, that we are being Zevi to the historians of the Italian post-war, right? seeking models in them, whereas in fact they were part of a field of that, that may or may not be doing what we, you know, maybe Tafri was actually, not, as you said, he was not half as intransigent as he's made out to be, and yet it's our sort of reaching back for that intransigence that, that lead him. So, is there a project there for, for situating him, especially within the sort of... Yeah, I think, uh, I think there are two things going on. One is, um, one is the project, if we want to keep using that term, to, uh, to, posi to write an intellectual history of that moment and to understand the traffic between uh, people who are writing and thinking about architecture and its history and, uh, and the sphere of ideas on which they draw. Uh, for me, Xavier and Tafudi are useful to put together because they they do exactly the job for us that um, that I played through this evening, namely to uh, to identify uh, through abstractions and and therefore overriding uh, some of the particularities of both of their cases um, positions within architecture in in relation to history. So there, I think, I mean, for 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 the question of how history works in architecture, how the historian works with architecture and for it and within it. Uh, I think there are probably two very, um, two key cases that could be exchanged for other individuals. Um, 
but uh, that's where my that's where my reading followed. Uh, I mean, one one just to to come back to Venice. There's a there is a um, a very nice lecture that uh, that Davuti delivered in ninety two or ninety three um, called uh, the Dignity of the, the Moment, which is looking at uh, episodes in the history of Venice and uh, treating really their historicity in um, uh, and precisely this uh, this terms of a, this term of a, of a viscosity that, that finishes with the uh, with the concert of Pink Floyd and the um, in the um, Piazza San Marco. It just occurred to me as a as a nice uh, example of of, uh, of a kind of historian who has this rhetoric of, uh, of uh, withholding the lessons of history from architects in order to make them work for the value of history for architecture, um, but who nonetheless has the present clearly in mind. It's, uh, um, it's a question of audience, it's a question of dissemination. Uh, there is the question of, um, uh, of the frames that, um, that can be activated in order to, uh, to activate lessons that are that are oblique but uh, but present nonetheless. Um, you can look even at the way that that Tafuri, for example, has a has a, um, a very clear position about um, uh, introducing minor documents into the discussion, introducing uh, uh, shifting away from grand narratives. But you know the monographic fi the treatise the figures he treats in a monographic fashion um, are key figures. It's a uh, it's Palladio, it's Giulio Romano. Uh, Piranesi, they're, they're key figures in the history of architecture, or have either been made to be, or the, with the positions reinforced by historical attention. Um, I think we, we could uh, address one question across the two panels, and that would be to put uh, Timothy and Ava's talks into some kind of comparative frame for a minute, and to, um, I, I'd like to um, unpack that a little bit, we probably can't do that here, but uh, if we put them together, we begin to get a very dire picture of the anonymous architect um, and a very positive picture of the monographic history. And I wonder if either of you wants to make some complex, com more complex construction around these two uh, papers, or if some me other members of the panel would like to do that. Or some members of the audience. Well, I can say something. Yeah, can I, I have a question for you. I was I was really struck by your Latourian term, yeah, yeah. because the you know the Latourian A and T uh, theory is devised to talk about non-human agency. That's the whole yeah. problem. How do you talk about the delegation that humans make when they're not there to machines and systems and networks? And you have a human. I mean, he is, and you've described in all the ways in which he is uh, human in, in very subtle terms. But I mean, essentially. I thought, I, I thought for a while you were trying to sort of undo Latour from within. It seems like one would want to uh, uh, have a theory of anonymity or of something that, that undermines the assumption that he's a human in the end. Well, I think the, you know, the, you know, situating him in this sort of idea that the identity is not something that, you know, we are, you know, it's not like a sentence subjectivity in the sense that, uh, you know, that I proposed that Arthur was born with, but something that, you know, is kind of independent, penetrates with the culture at large. Mm -hmm. That what I, th you know, I try right. to make kind of two moves, seeing him as part of this sort of operational network and right. in the, you know, amid his fellow human beings that influence him and so forth. The, the same move I try to make with architecture, with the culture at large, that architecture is not, you know, it, it, it's in a, in penetrated by, and cannot be understood without the, you know, the culture at so, so should we save his buildings? Uh, I mean, how many of his are UNESCO buildings? Do you have any UNESCO buildings? Uh, that sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, here, yeah. Here, that's right. Should we save his buildings? Yeah, I mean, I mean, when how many buildings of his should we save? I mean, this is going to be the next finished question. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I'm sure they will be. Yeah. So. They, they will be because, I but mean, why? partly. But why? Well, they will be, well, first of all, I do think know that he is a pretty good architect, you know, like Frank Lloyd Wright, but we are, you know, we have the privilege of staying in this Frank Lloyd Wright house, you know, we can, uh, you know, assign that there's certain qualities that, that has to do with individual talent, you know. But Finland, Finland had long, you know, sort of this romantic, I mean, you know, they yeah. had this sort of romantic, I mean, so this, how do we disassociate him from Finnish romanticism, you know, in its own 
longing, you know, against this geopolitical ambivalence. Well, I think it's a tool. Now or at that time? Well, it's now. I mean, at that time yeah. we can say they, you know, I mean, but now we would want to sort of, I would think, sort of try to interrogate the romantic illusion of Finnish architecture in Finland by Finns for Finns for I mean, Finnish tourism. For the world. For, yeah. for the world, of course. Yeah. And at the end. <laughs> I mean, also, of course, you know, there's also that, that, you know, what I try to portray is also I see, you know, in his time, how he saw the world and how the world saw him. Of course, the question is, you know, the saga continues. People still, you know, he's, there's a kind of what's called alto I mean, every yeah. Finn has the ways at home. But that is, you know, it's somewhat distinct, you know, from what what his milieu and what his, um, you know, what his kind of political, you know, the reception and what, you well, know, I've seen yeah. Would you, would you see some parallels between the problem of biography and the problem of writing nationalist histories? I mean, what, what kind of... It seems that, that the move that you've made to, uh, to almost take the person, or not take the person out of the biography or of the, out of the history, but to, uh, to dissolve the boundaries between the individual and, and, their, and the geopolitical context in this case, so the, exactly the same kind of moves that you're calling for in terms of those histories written of nations that... Right. Yeah, I think it's history. I mean, that, that's... Absolutely not, not the question. I think it's more like, okay, we've done that, but there's also then the haunted problem of that, you know, inevitably. Yeah. Yeah, but I was w wondering, you know, like what I propose really is in a way looking at individual and understand, and a, you know, and a, and a national law course, but understanding all these interactions also in the case of Finland, that it was really a broad geopolitical terrain that we have to consider. But it's in a way, you know, there's a certain level of, like I said, that it's it's a kind of a practical, you know, uh, datum against which, which to register, you know, all these sort of um, uh, geopolitical, um, you know, dynamics, you know, in a very broader terrain. I'm not, you know, talking about Aalto as a Finnish architect. I'm talking about Finland and Aalto in this sort of, pro, you know, as interacting <coughs> with this uh, broader terrain. So I was wondering, like, could one could one write, you know, because of course we are all kind of baffled by the immensity of this project of writing, uh, you know, global, it's like writing the biography of all the arch living architects, you know. So could one say the same, that one could take a single law course and, and try to figure out the kind of global history of architecture through a single, you know, datum of a, of a you know, of a locale? It's called French architectural history and it's all about France. Yeah. <laughs> well, history of the world happened. Um, we, have a, we, have a, we have a hand up. A random uh, I generally say no. I mean, we tried contextualism, yeah. you know, with logocentric, you know, yeah. arguments, and I just fall, you know, right off the truck, right into the arms of basically a type of, you know, uh, cultural nationalist biases. You know, I think the standard contextualism of local things is good, but it just got to be, it can't be, it's got to be by local try local, you know, you know, to just do yet a building uh, site or whatever it is and do the context is completely insufficient if you really want to do so global. It's not bad history, it's okay, but it's, but Mark, if you want to do global, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Mark, we can turn that story around. I mean, it, you know, there's a way that you can be an advocate for the global where basically nobody can enter. Right? I mean, you can speak like Hegel, right? You can speak for the universal where nobody fits the picture, right? I mean, on the other hand, if you take either the biographical or the national, uh, let's say it's methodological formats from which to paint a certain kind of subjective image, right, of some kind or the other. Um, one could notice, for instance, that in a lot of places, nationalism is exactly the, the front through which the universal and the modern are glimpsed. They're not antithetical, they're exactly the opposite. I mean, the staging of Kumayan's tomb, you would notice, is a Muslim monument in a Hindu majority community, country that was exactly a signaling of universalism and not a cultural nationalism. You could say something, I mean, I, you know, you could say something similar about the problem of biography. It's, it's, it's a, it's a I mean, it seems like, uh, um, 
immediately, of course, hagiography and so on and so forth. But I mean, on a sheer empirical level, it's actually a, a very difficult thing to do. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, writing an MIT book, a senior professor who has his office next to mine won't be named. But you know, he said, that's not how I remember MIT. And I'm like, what date? Okay, let's say February 4th, 1966. What did you have for breakfast? Um, of course, one doesn't remember. Then you ask, okay, so you remember the committee meeting that day? You know, so it's a it's a difficult to, to go to the biographical can be equally as, as absurd or abstruse a project as to construct something called the universal, right? I mean, it's I I don't see why one would in advance without sort of taking up the methodological problems inherent in each prefer one against the other. I mean, it depends, right? I mean, I'm just sort of curious as to why, yeah. Uh, Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. <laughs> so, I have a question for Mark. Can I ask Mark a question? Yeah. He wasn't my assigned. Uh, <laughs> can, can you talk about curatorial ideology? Because you, you uh, talk about the sort of curatorial enlargement, uh, you know, that architecture has triumphed. And it's, it's true that in terms of square footage over paintings and stuff, we have that. So two questions. One is, you know, contemporary art has staged itself as curating not just uh, paintings anymore, but of course life and experimental life. And so how does that relate? And it seems like architecture is aligning itself with that in ways that are perhaps anti rational I mean, that, that, are, that wants itself avant-garde and wants it to think of itself as a critical practice. And secondly, then also in terms of, um, you know, architectural scholarship, there's a way one can think of your textbook as a curatorial endeavor, one that is not afraid, that, that precisely does not say global history is the history of everything. No, global history is very specific. Yeah. Universal things have specific histories. And so it seems like maybe the critique of curatorial ideology as a whole is maybe uh, sort of premature. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I always feel weird because, you know, I'm you know, working with two art historians and they talk about curatorship. The assumption is always paintings. I mean, or, you know, it's a museum world. You know, so I, you know, show my map and a <laughs> little diagram, and I say, you know, I mean, you know, the amount of curated space in a museum compared to the amount of curated space in the natural world out there with buildings and barns and uh, structures and landscapes, you know, you, know you, you can curate what you want in a museum, but basically, you know, 90% of the world is being curated, is happening there, right? And this is the, happened only in the last 10 or 15 years. So, curator, if you go to, you know, I just go to the web and look at, you know, programs on curatorship. Right. Right. None of this appears. <coughs> this is just completely non-existent, right? They're not taught how to engage, you know, all of the complexities of architectural curatorship, right? Which is this sort of bizarre combination, if you will, of, uh, of, of, of all sorts of modernization technique, uh, techniques overlaid on a type of sort of romantic gloss. No one teaches them how to do that, how to critique it, how to challenge it, challenge it at all. So where does it go? Right? It just goes into practice, into sort of political practices, into uh, architectural practices, into all sorts of, it's out there, it's happening, but there's no contact of that in our academia. Right? So we're going undergoing in the last 10 years, I think, huge philosophical, uh, architectural, cultural changes that are just happening at such a speed that we haven't caught on to that yet. Right? We're, we're way, we're just, you're still thinking, you know, 100 years ago, right? You're still putting architecture at the bottom, curatorship is, you know, the little painting on the so you've, you've just articulated the future of history right now, so I, I think our immediate future should also be embraced um, in the form of a glass of wine and something to eat. 